CNF Worldwide for nomads everywhere. <laughs> How we doing out there, nomads? This is Jason from CNF LTD. Uh, we're here at Catabatic Brewing in Livingston, Montana, and we are with Lynette Jones. Lynette. Are you the founder of Catabatic? Uh, my husband and I are the founders of Catabatic founders Brewing. Of Catabatic. And yeah. what, uh, how long have you guys been open here? Almost five years, about four and a half. Five years, wow. okay. So, and are you natives to the Livingston area or did you move No, in? we are native Montanans, but not, we moved here to open the brewery. Oh, fantastic. Yes. And uh, so to get into the, the brewery side of things first, um, why brewing? Why why open Catabatic? <laughs> well, but Bryce and I were both looking for sort of the next thing to do. We both had careers for quite a while. Um, I was a social worker for a long time, and Bryce was a uh, wildland firefighter, oh, smoke wow. jumper. And so we were just kind of both trying to just try something new. And we love breweries, and we used to talk about all the things we wanted to maybe try and do while we were in breweries. And then one day we thought, well, could we open a brewery? So we looked into it, and here we are. And what was that process like opening <laughs> the brewery? I know one of the biggest thing, obviously, funding. And then, so were you guys self-funded? Do you have to get some loans in order to open the operation? Or? We have some loans, and we have a few investors, and then Bryce and I's uh, contribution to it as well. And uh, we actually went to, my husband went to the Siebel Institute's course on how to start your own brewery. Oh, excellent, excellent. Which was a fantastic course, and it really just gave that foundation for the structure and infrastructure of what we, you know, needed to start working on if we wanted to do this. And then how was the, uh, I guess, from the day you decided, okay, we're going to do this, <laughs> until the doors actually, you know, were pushed open to the public? So after the course, I would say the course was kind of the impetus behind like, yeah, I think we can do this um, until the doors opened. It was close to three years. Three years. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yes. And then in that time period, I mean, the, the I, mean, I don't want to say growing pains, but just, you know, the learning curve for going, okay, like we did the course <laughs> and everything, but then actually jumping in. Yep. And it was the business plan and right, uh, the, yeah, getting finding the investors and getting that whole process together, which is a, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the hardest part. I think once we open the doors, um, it's, it's definitely still challenging and it's difficult. But it, the process of putting the financials together, getting all the uh, legal documents together for shareholders, um, getting our brewing license, just that whole like structure of and process and paperwork and yeah so you say paperwork that's actually mm -hmm. directly in the next question <laughs> regulatory uh just different hurdles and things in the state of montana how are they as far as is it i want to say self-explanatory but is it easy process to follow a lot of hurdles in red tape or was it fairly easy um i mean it's the application's fairly uh con complete as far as how it lines it out and what you need to submit. And then after you submit items, the state does get in contact with you about additional questions and additional documents that it needs and okay. things like that. So I think because we're, I mean, we're a large state, but we have very few people. Um, and at the time we only had probably about 40 something breweries. Okay. And wow. so I do feel like during that, t I don't know what it's like now at 80 something breweries, um, but at that time it, it did feel like they were, you know, helping us be success successful. And then, so once the uh, the doors are open, how did the community respond? Really well. Um, I think, you know, at first, be coming into a small town, everybody kind of wants to know who you are and what you're about and what that's, what's going on. And, you know, I think we just opened the doors in, in such a way that we're kind of a community center. Uh, we offer so many things here for the community to do. Um, it's ongoing even outside of craft beer week that we're in right now. And so I think that the community just really saw that, liked it, and has just been really big supporters. Um, we also sold mugs and steins. So we have a mug club membership and a golden stein membership. Awesome. And so a lot of people have invested themselves in this brewery. It's a lifetime membership and it's sort of their investment in us 
and it's in this community. Best business card you can have is a satisfied the customer. customer yep. right? <laughs> it's, it's interesting you bring up the community center part because literally as recently as yesterday when we were in Rapid City speaking with Minor, um, all the way back to the Eastern Shore of Maryland and Columbus, Ohio, where we've been recently, that's something that's repeated over and over again by the brewers where uh, the things we hear are, you, we don't, this isn't a place where you come and you know, drink to excess. You don't come here to get hammered or anything like that. We want to be a place where you can have your kids here, your grandparents come here. It's a nice place to just sit, relax, enjoy some beers. Yep. And that's where it stops. You don't come here. It's not a party atmosphere. You're not no. going crazy. No, and in Montana, you can only have three beers per person every 48 hours. Really? So we don't have a, we have a manufacturing license. And in that licensed manufacturer beer, we're allowed to serve 48 ounces per person per day in our sample room, which is what you're in right now. Yes, right now. Um, but it's become, become, and I think to, you know, our last call is at 8 p.m. And so because it's at 8 p.m., it's, it creates that family friendly environment. It creates that, and because you only have three beers, it, it even makes that more so here in the state. And at first when that law kind of came about, because for a while you could only manufacture beer, you couldn't have a tap room. So in 1999, the state of Montana allowed tap rooms and that, that law of uh, 48 ounces per person. And you know, when it first came about, people were like, well, how's that a good business model? How's that gonna work? And it just, because it's breweries, you know, historically even in the state of Montana and I think in the nation were very much based in communities, um, it sort of kind of reenacted that same feeling and that same uh, idea for communities. And it just became, it's just become a very successful business model. We've all made it work and we've figured out how to um, only serve till 8 p.m., only serve three beers per person and still be viable businesses. That's very impressive. And there's <laughs> battles state by state across the country yes. about because I know, you know I'm not going to name drop any of the brewers so they don't get in trouble. But in New Jersey, insane amount of regulation, insanely strong distribution lobby yeah. that impedes tap room expansion and hours and things like that. So it's nice to hear at least Montana yeah. is. Well, we still have the same challenges. Same, I mean, a little, we a little bit of the same breweries would like to be open longer. We would like the option to have a brew pub license that allows us to serve beer and wine. Um, so we would like some of those things and we, we have the same hurdles and the same challenges. And a lot of that is, you know, after prohibition, the three tier system mm -hmm. was uh, developed for those checks and balances. Um, and it's also created hardships for many different establishments, establishment types trying to grow or do different things that were not set up to be that way traditionally, um, coming out of prohibition. And you know, breweries weren't even, I don't even know when breweries were allowed, like as far as the manufacturing side, but that was much later on. And I don't know the history fully behind that. And so I think that's just, it's good to have the checks and balances, but it also may, it gives challenges to trying to grow your business outside of what is allowed. Right, and the laws aren't always crafted for the future they're okay we need to address this situation and it, not in anticipation of hey this might grow at a rapid rate such as the current craft beer Correct. community right now as far as your actual products here the brews who comes up with those comes up with these beers initially the first beer and kind of our standards we have four standards um, the honey ale was more recently so we had the half of eisen when we opened um, was my husband. He kind of came up with the, the initial recipes and worked with our initial brewer on refining those in a commercial system. And so we still have three of those recipes. And then everything else, um, since we've opened, we've really just invested in our brewers and their knowledge and um, their abilities and their creativity, which I think is really important because, you know, at five years, it's not that we're not creative or that we don't have ideas, but it's a bit more of a struggle when you've got the entire business to run and so many different factors and pieces and parts that are running. And so it's really nice to be able to hear from them on what they want to do and just saying, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. <laughs> and I think some places where you see there, they, a lot of trends developed. Like recently, what was it? A few like years ago was the Belgians doing wheat beers and things. And lately it's been the hazy IPAs, the New England IPAs and things like that. 
Um, so do you, is there any of that, any attention paid to brewing trends or you kind of stick to what you, you know, so, your staff wants to do or what the community is asking for? Yeah, you know, I think Bryce and I are traditionalists just in general with beer. Um, you know, if you when you do taste the beer on our uh, menu, it is very much within the brewing standards and it matches a lot of the, pretty much I'd say like 90% and matches the descriptions in the BJCP certifications. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, we're, we are strong traditionalists, but we do have some fun with the beer. We try not to be too much like stodgy. You don't yeah, want to be yeah. stodgy. Um, and so we do, you know, we, we've done a Northeast um, New England IPA. And I think actually it's on, yeah, the Hop Haiku is on oh, right now. Uh, and so, but you know, the glitter beer, for example, we won't do a glitter beer. Um, and it's just it's just too far outside of right, right, what, right. kind of what we focus on and what we like to do. And with our like Northeast style IPA, we'll serve it in house because it's very unstable because it has a lot of sediment in it. It's really hard to put in a keg and a can and feel like for us, feel like we're getting that consistency that we would want in the market. And so some of the things that lead what we do and how we do it um, has to do with being very consistent and tried and true when you can get the same flavor of beer here as you can in a bar and restaurant in Missoula, Montana, which is like four hours away. True. So. So then, speaking of bars and restaurants, distribution. Yes. What's that like for Catabatic? We have um, three different distributors. We. Oh, wow. We, because the state's so big, um, you really, there's regions. And so um, we could technically have probably four to hit more regions, um, but we have three right now. We kind of as far east as Billings and as far west as Missoula. Okay. Um, and those are two different distributors. And then our area and our region is another distributor. So. And is there any self-distribution allowed in Montana? There is self-distribution. And we did self-distribute for the first year. And we kind of built up our own accounts in this region. Um, but it's, it's challenging. I mean, you, when we started doing it, we thought, well, maybe this would be a good thing to just continue to do and try to build up our own distribution for Catabatic. But you know, when it comes down to it, it's, you know, we've always asked this question over and over every year, every month, every day, I swear. It's what are we in the business to do? We're in the business to make beer. And that's what we want to focus on because it's really easy to get pulled in multiple directions in your business plan. Um, but, you know, yes, we don't make as much money as we would in self-distribution. But then all of the fleets and the employees and everything else that we would have to um, build up for self-distribution would really eat that profit. And so it doesn't, you know, might as well use people that know what they're doing. <laughs> exactly, like you said, yeah, it's like you brew the beer, they deliver the beer. And exactly. the relationship, as long as it's working and yes. everybody's making what they need to to keep the businesses going, Yes, we can be happy. Yep. And then people get to taste the beer wherever they go. Yeah. I definitely want to hit on Pink Boots Society as well, because we were talking a bit before we started recording today about um, just their whole, I guess if you could give your take on the Pink Boots Society and how you've interacted with that um, yeah. group and where you maybe see women in brewing pushing forward, like how they're to incorporate more women into the brewing community. Right. And so that's what Pink Boots Society exists for, is to kind of just promote and acknowledge women in the beer industry. And not it, it's not just in breweries, it's women who serve beer and who are in any way interact with craft beer. Um, and I think that's important because it really highlights there's a, you know, there's a lot of servers that are very interested in craft beer and learn a lot about it in a restaurant environment that are just as important as the servers in a brewery. Um, and be, especially with my products there, because I want them to know as much as possible about beer if they're talking to customers out there. So exactly. I think that that link is really important in what they do. And we've, um, I know that I've been a member. I'm not sure if my membership's up to date just because I'm bad at that kind of thing. We won't tell. <laughs> Everyone won't say anything. <laughs> um, I believe Sarah, our taproom manager, is a member as well. And we've worked with Phillipsburg Brewing Company to um, brew a beer for the state, Pink Boots Society for the state. Awesome. And, um, awesome, awesome. I think, I believe that Sarah did one with uh, Beer Maven, who you're going to be talking with later today. Yes. Um, Loy as well in, over in Bozeman. I think it was just a year ago. And so, oh, cool. you know, we try to send, we wouldn't mind hosting one, um, but it's just, we have such a small facility and right. we're always brewing or filtering or just you know, getting beer out to distributors. 
that it's really hard to open up our calendar for that special beer. Um, but one of these days, we definitely want to do that. So it's not a question of if you want to, it's when it's can, when, when it's can the it happen. It's on it, right. so, yeah. <laughs> now, for people who may not have been to Catabatic or thinking about coming through Livingston, which you absolutely should, <laughs> um, of your standards, so we got four standards here, the Tippy Truck Honey, Catabatic Scotch Ale, the Pale Ale, and an IPA. What would you say is maybe the best, like, gateway beer into your menu here in your lineup that you have the best gateway beer if if you're not in if you're not familiar with craft beers or you're um kind of coming from the domestics to the craft beer i would say is our honey ale or to be truck honey ale Ooh. um it's local honey from a really small town called harwell town um just central montana awesome it's tiny tiny and and so it's fun to partner with them and help them get their honey out there uh and then you know if the thing about the standards and the way that they're set up is is for people who so the intro beer is the honey ale the malt for people who really love malty beers the scotch ale is a great guy, one right yes here. it is phenomenal <laughs> has caramel chocolate and vanilla flavors in it and it doesn't have any of the that syrupy aftertaste at all it's very crisp and clean mm. it's phenomenal all the right um, words <laughs> <laughs> and then our pale ale is it's a really good introduction for people who are just getting used to hops um, it is very, it seems more hoppy than our IPA because we played with the aroma on it. So we significantly uh, dry hopped it, which doesn't really add to the bitterness at all on your palate. Um, but a lot of people think that it might, that it's more hoppy because you get that um, sensory overload with the smell. Um, but it's, it's just a lot less bitter on the palate than the IPA. And then both the pale ale and IPA are West Coast style. Um, oh, okay. And awesome. so we are, we really, you know, we're not doing the English style pale ale or IPA. Now, if you were forced to pick your favorite <laughs> of the Euro lineup here, what would you go for? My favorite is the pale ale. The pale ale. It is. Good to go. Yeah. Now, uh, the number of breweries, as you mentioned, I think it was around 80 now in the state of Montana. I think I read 87. But 87? I, somewhere around there. And this, I guess starting today through this Saturday, is tap into Montana, which is why we came out here. Yes. to hang out um and there i believe I, if i've read the right it was like was it 29 breweries are coming to this? yes I'm we have 29 sure. coming to this one that is incredible and it's right up the road here on is it the park right yep. on the river yeah, right on the river because i was just again haven't been to this town before been looking at the satellite it's images super close. it's about it was, five blocks from here yeah, I'm completely it's like i've never been to a beer festival <laughs> it was just right on the river and then driving through and even the in mountain this, range in the background wait till I, you guys just, do the it's, video it's annoying there. how perfect the <laughs> setting is almost this is like the whole time again we're east coast based and coming out here every time we turn around to go back it's like, why where what are we doing that for it's the wrong decision what is happening here um and what can uh like what i guess we're kind of going to be hanging out with your yes. crew yes um filming like crazy all day can you give us a, like at least a heads up what yeah. can we expect to see this weekend yeah so it's happened in montana is uh it's a business between myself and my girlfriend rachel who's a marketing company marketeur and so it just sort of was a one day not a lot of notice i was like in two months do you think we could pull together a craft beer week in brew fest and she's like sure so we started that <laughs> this is our fifth one so we started that five years ago and um she we just sort of it was small and we've grown it and now it's it's i think where it's at and the location and how we do it is just part of why people love coming to this uh brew fest we have people who travel here for it and make it kind of an annual pilgrimage cool. i would say um, but we just we're right on the river it's in april so weather is variable and we have these huge tents um and you know the breweries have their own tents that are underneath them and it's just this really neat um, fill because you're, it's, it's like, you know, spring here is just so wonky. Like you can either have 90 degree weather or you can, you know, be 15 and snowing. And last year we got about 10 inches of snow <laughs> <laughs> the day of, or maybe that night, the night before. And uh, we were snow blowing out underneath the tents and we were creating like, you know, trying to create space for everybody to put there <laughs> without being knee high. We had ice everywhere. We had 800 people come. And so, like, I think it's just, it, it also, it, 
I always like to say it's indicative of our environment. Like Livingston is, Katabatic is a cold downslope wind that's very common in Livingston, especially in the winter months. Thank you. And so the, um, you know, the environment here, it's, it's windy, it's colder, it's, our motto is rugged yet refined. It's a very rugged community and it has a lot of refined elements to it. Um, and the brew fest just sort of epitomizes that with having it in April, having it, you know, under a tent and making it variable and just, you get to experience all kinds of, uh, just all kinds of weather, all kinds of, and, you know, and with every weather, there's different personalities, like with the snow, people were just in the great best spirits. <laughs> it was just phenomenal. And they, you know, people still came and we sold tons of tickets the day of, they, you know, they know that we're not going to awesome. cancel it because of snow or weather or, and it's just, sort of just shows the spirit of Livingston, really. That's incredible. I was to think that was going to be my next question. And so it's going, no matter what happens between today and Saturday. Yes. It's happening. It's happening. It's on. No. Yep. Fan. Yes. And we have great music. Um, you know, we have a band and we have food vendors and that's just a lot of fun. Yeah, get a lot of local like food vendors and different things just like that. Just two food vendors because you don't want to overdo it. But sure. um, and we partnership with the Montana Brewers Association. Um, to throw the event, so it's super helpful. Awesome. Yeah. So, I guess this, this is the big question here that we always ask everybody. <laughs> For people who haven't been here or are thinking maybe they want to come check out just Montana in general, especially if we're so close to Yellowstone, yeah. and the scenery out here is gorgeous. We just we drove in in a snowstorm today from Sheridan, <laughs> and it was still beautiful, it's even gorgeous. though you know there's puddles of slush everywhere on the highway. <laughs> it was still amazing to see. But if you could give a, you know just a word, words of wisdom, or just something to motivate somebody, if you're thinking about coming here to go to take yeah. the leap and do it, what would you what would you say to them? I think the great thing about the state is that there's it's so varied from the east all the way to the west, which could take up to 15 hours to travel through in one day. Um, and I think even for people like the outdoors, obviously is the, the biggest motivator for a lot of people who come out here, but I would challenge people who even don't like the outdoors to come and enjoy our towns because the towns here have so much to offer. Um, and you don't have to be enthusiastic about hiking or the river or anything like that. You can take in the views and you can take in the scenery um, and every town has something unique and different about it. And I think that that's, I mean, I've lived in probably five or six different towns in Montana and I'm from here, but you know, it's just everything, every, every town has an identity and it's pretty cool. And the breweries in those towns really reflect that identity. So I think it's really cool to just, just come. Don't worry about what you, if you fit into that outdoor persona or not, you don't have to. And the people here are just so friendly that if you want to know where the where a cool hiking trail or a great thing to do is, they'll let you know that. And if you want to know where a really great place that you have to see in town is, they'll let you know that too. Uh, so I think I think that's one of the things that's misrepresented is you know the tour side of our state is very outdoor recreation focused. That's great. I think it should be, but we're missing all the all the folks who might not want to do that because we have so much more to offer as well than just outdoors. So, for all you listeners and viewers out there. <laughs> There is no excuse, there really. Isn't. Just whatever you like to do. You want to be in town. You want to be out in the wilderness, away from, uh, far away from any town. Montana has what you need. They have great food, great views, and great breweries. Yes. So we strongly urge you, take the leap. Come visit Montana. Come to Livingston. Check out Catabatic, which is a gorgeous tap room, which we'll be filming shortly. <laughs> and. Lynette, thank you so much you. for allowing us to come here and letting us hang out with you for the next few days. Yeah. So take it easy, Nomads, and we'll see you on the next one. See you worldwide for Nomads Everywhere. This broadcast was produced by CNF Limited for Nomads Everywhere. The contents of this broadcast are the property of CNF Limited. All rights are reserved. For more information about CNF publications, contact us at 305 707 4024. Find us on the web at cndfltd.com.